Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Raised to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. We're going to be reading 1 John and how and how he talks about Jesus is the light of the world, which we remember from the prologue of John Wright. But before we get started, a little bit about this Bible study. I host a live Bible study every Friday on Instagram at Raised to Walk, and then I upload that later to YouTube. If you'd like any more information about this Bible study, you can go to raisedtowalk.org and do a search for the one-year chronological Bible, and that gives an explanation of the reading plan, and what we've been going through and it shows how you can um, follow along in the reading plan with either the Bible or on the YouVersion Bible app. And we are almost to the end. We have this one and the next week and we're to the end of our uh, one-year chronological Bible. So the reading for today is actually from December 24th and 25th. So you can see we're almost to the end, but um, like if you go up to the 26th, I mean literally just a few pages left. So if you are just, this is a first video that you're watching and you're just um, jumping in now, you could actually start this on January 1 and by um, this time next year you would be almost, have read almost all the way through the Bible. This has just been a really great reading plan. It's been a great experience. This is the first time that I've read through the Bible chronologically. I've read through the Bible a number of times before just, you know, reading through um, just on my own with, you know, straight through, but this has been a really um, just kind of an, an enlightening sort of experience because it, it just gives you more of a sense of everything that was going on at the time when the different writers were writing and it, it puts things in perspective. So today's reading is on, um, it's actually on December 24th. I'm going to read most of the letter of John, not all of it, but there's just so much good stuff in it. We're so close to the end of this one year chronological Bible that I just feel like I need to read a little bit more than sometimes that I normally do. But this letter was written by the Apostle John. So he wrote these three letters in um, the first, second, and third John in the New Testament. He also wrote the Gospel of John as well as the book of Revelation. So looking at this, um, this particular Bible, the scholars put it between the 60s and the 90s in the first century AD. So they think it was written somewhere during that time. Now, if it was written in the 60s, it kind of gives a little bit different cast to this. I am guessing maybe it was written a little bit later because we have to remember that the big event of the first century, besides Jesus' death and resurrection, of course, but in terms of Judaism, was the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Before that, there was a lot of persecution of the of the, the Christians. Um, you know, it says in Acts that you know that the leaders saw how much it pleased the Jews that when they you know persecuted the Christians, so they increased that to kind of make peace with the Jews. But at in 70 AD, there was um, there was a revolt, and they were crushed by the Romans, and the temple was completely destroyed. That was a major demarcation between. Um, Second Temple Judaism and what is now a rabbinic Judaism. It's a lot different. Uh, so there, there was just a lot of drama going on overall. So you have the the followers of what was Second Temple Judaism and then morphed into something a little bit different in rabbinic Judaism who rejected Jesus. And so they were saying that they were the, you know, they had the truth. And then you have the people in the Christians and there was this little segment within the within the church that tried to really follow put the law as more of a, of a point of salvation than you know a what it had been before was kind of a protection against judgment and now we know that you know now after Jesus has died you know his blood is our protection so I've said this in multiple Bible studies before but salvation didn't change at the cross. Salvation has always been faith in the salvation of God. In Genesis 15 uh, verse 6 it says, And Abraham believed God and his faith was counted as righteousness. So it was that faith in God's salvation that was the salvation of Abraham. The reason they had the sacrificial system was because um, those sins before the cross had to be had to be atoned for by blood and at that time it was animal blood and so that atonement pushed back judgment for the sins that you know everyone does after the cross it's jesus's blood that is our atonement for sins it is our protection you know it's a place that you know that god not only the sins are not only covered but they're wiped away they're just they're gone um but in that first church we see in especially in 
Galatians, uh, there was another chapter or another book that I was reading uh, as I was going through it that it seemed like there was a lot of, um, you know, stress on, you know, the work of the cross versus trying to follow the law. I mean, there was just a lot of tension. You see that I just started, um, we moved into Revelation, I think, yesterday in the, the in the reading. You see that in, I think, a little bit in Revelation, too, where John's talking about, you know, these people. He talks about a synagogue of Satan that says, you know, they're the ones that God's love, the letter of First John, because he's... It's like people are there's there's all this this tension and this this argument and and um, he's there's if it's after the sixties if it's like in seventies or you know after and after the destruction of the temple Peter and Paul were martyred under Nero before the destruction of the temple a lot of apostles of, and those first hand witnesses were um, had been martyred and so they don't have there's getting to be more. Um, other teachers coming in saying, you know, we have the revelation and not as many of those people that had seen uh, Jesus face to face and heard his message firsthand. John was probably the last living apostle. He, um, the early church writer said that he lived to a great age. And so his testimony in John still um, is a testimony of not only that they saw God and Jesus as God, but that, you know, it is through grace and through the love of God, not under the law or works. So anyway, I'm going to start in verse one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked on and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life that was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested to us that we have seen and we have heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So we can see in this opening that John is stressing that he saw it for himself. This isn't just something that you know he's heard passed down, that he saw it for himself and he's establishing his credibility and his authority as a witness to the truth of Jesus. So continuing uh, on verse five. So here, like really listen to what John is saying. So keep in mind that there are elements. There's there's basically two different things that are going on. There's the rise of the um, docetists, which said that Jesus didn't actually live as human, that didn't come in the flesh. Um, and there were different forms of docetism. And then there's also the Judaizers who are saying, trying to, put it back under the law. And we'll, I'll stop and we can do a little reflection on some of these others, but this is what's going on. So listen to how John refers to, um, refers to Jesus as a light. Okay. This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So, there's just so much in this. Um, it says that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. I have a an article um, or a book review on my site, Race to Walk. It's called Mercy, and Mercy, Meet, and Grace, and it's a review of the two powers of heaven. It's a book by a Jewish scholar who actually examined the belief um, in during the Second Temple period in the two powers of, of Yahweh. So uh, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, the Jews and, you know, Trinity is this pagan invention and the Jews didn't know, you know, they had no concept of the Trinity, which is actually not true. Um, and the two powers in heaven actually examines the belief that uh, there were 
you know, two, the two powers that, you know, God, who we would know as God the Father and the Logos, you know, as separate persons. And so if you want to read more about that, you can. But the other thing from that book that I did not know until I, I read the, um, Ellen Siegel is the author of that book. Until I read his book, was that in Judaism they believe that God is the author of both good and evil. And so, keep in mind that there was a lot of uh, turmoil in um, Judaism at, at that time. And so it makes me think that that was a discussion that was going on at the time. And John is saying here, God is light, and there's no darkness in Him at all. We have, I think it repeats, he also repeats this in Revelation too, but um, this is one of the reasons why I hated the Son of God movie, because it ends with, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but it, it ends with them saying that, but there was darkness in the light. No, there wasn't. There isn't. I just, I don't like that movie. I know some people really like it. I just don't. Anyway, um, the other thing that, as I was reading through this, it, it says, it, this is a thing. So, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have to confess our sins. We have to recognize that we do wrong. And it says, we have fellowship with, with God and with Christ when we walk in the light. So if we choose to do, um, have wrong actions and if we choose to reject God's truth and to follow in his truth, then we're basically stepping in darkness, isn't there? So this is one of the things that I think is, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do because it's not works, but we should, but the presence of the Holy Spirit should be evidence in our works that, that we're fully submitted to God. That when we, um, you know, when we confess our sins and acknowledge that those things are wrong and we submit, we submit ourselves to God and, and try and follow his will. It's not our works. It's the Holy Spirit working through us. Right. But it's, when as you read as we read continue to read this in John it's it's like this fine line it's it would be much easier if you could say oh it's just all grace like uh you know there are some some people that do that that basically say that you can do whatever sin you want and you know it doesn't matter i mean that's not really what it's saying it's 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 not that you lose your salvation because you, you didn't gain your salvation because of your works and you don't lose your salvation because of your works but if your works don't line up with what your profession of faith then are you still actually believing so it's about the belief and the faith in God and so if we continue to do actions that aren't in line with with that faith then eventually one of those things has to change right so either our Actions have to line up with what we say we believe, or our belief is going to change to be in line with our actions. Because there's really no way that you know we don't we want to be we want to feel like we're being consistent and we're we're congruent that we have this integrity. We don't want to have that inner turmoil of thinking that we're hypocrites. So we have to change we have to change our beliefs, right? If if we do these continue to do these actions that contradict what we say we believe. And I, I've seen people do that, you know, I, that they are real into, you know, I've seen people that even think that they're uh, so far kind of past the cross and into law that they thought they were Torah observant. And now they're like, like pantheistic new agey people because, and not that they ever told me this, but just me as an outside observer, I think it was because they were making some choices and in their life that completely contradicted what they said they believed. And so their beliefs changed because of the actions that they took. So anyway, um, the other thing, the other passage that this reminds me of is um, Psalm 51, 10 through 12. And this was when it was written after David um, had committed adultery with Bathsheba and just all the horrible stuff with um, Uriah. You know, he basically had Uriah killed and tried to cover everything up. And so in this in this psalm, he is praying to God and, and it's verse 10 starts, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. And so he is he's asking God to cleanse his heart because he, he knows that he is a sinner and 
he is here he is confessing that sin to God and he's asking you know he's this is lines almost perfectly up with what John is saying here in his letter that he wants to continue to walk in that fellowship with God okay so going down to verse oh we're already to chapter 2 chapter 2 verse 1 they have it broken up differently in the, in the one year chronological Bible so sometimes it's hard to tell when new chapters start but my little children these things I write to you so that you may not sin and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word... Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself to also walk just as he walked. Okay. Brethren, I write to you no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So uh, on, um, this is in verse 8 in chapter 2. So the dark, darkness is passing away and the light is already shining. So when Jesus rose from the, rose from the dead and Pentecost came and, and it, you know, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this is a reclaiming of God's kingdom, right? So this is a progressive thing. It's as people come to him, as God reclaims his imagers and they, they come to him in faith, that the dominion of Satan is is. Is passing away now it won't completely pass away until Jesus returns right but it is that is our um, that's our mi our mission we're supposed to you know proclaim the Gospels and make disciples of all nations we're supposed to let other people know about the freedom and the salvation that is in God this passage I think is really important especially today it says he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And then down on verse 11, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And I think that this is something that we need to remember that um, especially in the US today, we have so many people that equate their political position with their religion or and they put it seem almost seemed to me I mean I don't think they would say this but sometimes it seems to me like they you know equate their salvation with how they vote and they a lot of times people use that as an excuse to condemn and revile um, other people and you know here John is saying he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and that's a, it's a repeat of the same thing that Jesus said. He said, anyone who calls his brother, as the word was raka, but it means idiot, has already committed murder in his heart. Yeah. So, and, and that's, a, that's a verse that I always, you know, every time I read it, I know God's saying, yep, I'm talking to you. Because I have a hard time with that. I'll be honest. Like, people make me mad. Especially, like, our, I've talked about this before, our school board, and it just, all the stuff that's going on, all the shady things, you know, and some of the local politics. I'm like, it just infuriates me, but especially the school board, because it's like, you know, I see the direct impact on it, you know, on, you know, my kids, on their friends and on, you know, the Sundays, the kids in my Sunday school class every single week. And so when I see things that they say and, and dismissing the problems that are there, it just infuriates me. It really makes me mad. I'll tell you what, I have, I have a hard, I have a hard time praying for them because they, it just, it just makes me so mad. But this is what it's saying. Anyone who hates his brother is in darkness. So if we want to be in fellowship with God, if we want to be walking in the light as he is in the light, we need to be praying for people, even people that we don't particularly care for and that don't agree with us. And I, um, I don't watch a lot of, um, 
I don't really watch church TV. I don't watch, most of the people, most of the Bible teachers I watch, I watch a lot of Derek Prince. I think he's awesome. But I've recently, I've been watching a few of um, Patricia King's broadcasts. I watched a couple of hers and she said that, you know, you, you pray for people who are in leadership positions. It doesn't mean you would have to agree with them, but you pray for them. And she said that you know, you always have to, when you see things like this going on, when people, she was talking a lot about sexual immorality. She said, when you see people like that, you, you're praying for them to be restored. You want them to repent and be restored. And you, you don't continue to condemn them and, um, you know, and basically speak a curse over them as it's what we're doing when we, when we do that, whoever sins you forgive will be forgiven and that, that sin will be released. And so I read it one time in a certain translation, releasing them from the force of the wrongs. So when Jesus was on the cross, he said, you know, father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. This was before we confessed. This is before anyone had repented of that sin. He, of any sin, actually, right? So, and he said, you forgive them. So he had forgive. He had already released us from the force of our sins before we've confessed. And so as we're, you know, these people that we see around them, that's how we're supposed to treat them too. We're supposed to be releasing them from that sin. We're supposed to be asking God to forgive them and we see this wrong and asking God to forgive them. So like when, when you're sitting there and someone's done something wrong, they're condemned, right? When you continue to condemn them, that's an additional layer hang, hang, holding them down. When you forgive them and you ask God to forgive them, you're releasing them from the force of this wrong, this thing that's holding them down. And you're in the spirit, you're giving them this, this encouragement and this, um, this, this move of the spirit to help them come to a place of repentance. So if someone's wronged you, if someone's, um, if you see something that you think is, is not right, rather than speaking condemnation and, um, essentially cursing them, you know, try praying for them and asking God, you know, like, please forgive them. I know how much this grieves you. Please forgive them and please bring them to you. Give them, you know, empower them to be, to recognize that what they're doing is wrong because a lot of times we don't see our own wrongness. We need the Holy Spirit to help reveal that those things that are, are holding us now down. And so it says in here, and it's talking about people who are condemning their brother, but it says, because the darkness has blinded our eyes. And that's true of all of us. This is in verse 12. I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sakes. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the father. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So this is, it's like you have overcome the wicked one. This is, this is promising that we don't have to live in bondage to our sins. And I know that there's some teachers out there just saying that, you know, it doesn't really matter. You're going to keep sinning. You know, you're, it doesn't really matter. You know, God's going to bring who, who, to him who he wants. That's, I'm sorry. That's just a lie of Satan. That is a lie of Satan. It's saying that you, you know you don't have any hope of overcoming that sin, and that's not true. It, you know, it's not. This isn't the only place that it says that in the Bible. It says because and, and you have overcome the wicked one. That that we do, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we do have the power to and the ability to overcome those those things that tie us down. Okay. Uh, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, this, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 
They went out from us, but they were not of us, for they had been, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges his Son has the Father also. So I think we can see here that there were people who had been within the church that kind of went off the well and denied. That, now when they're saying that Jesus is a Christ, they're saying that it's more than just a Messiah. That he is the, um, he's saying here that whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. So here John is saying that if someone doesn't acknowledge that Jesus is God as the Christ, that they are the Antichrist, that's the Antichrist spirit. And so we can see that happening. There was an early sect called the Ebonites who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but he wasn't God. You know, he was just enabled by it. Sometimes now with people who are modalists, they um, don't believe that Jesus is was like a sec separate person. They basically believe that there is, God is one, one person, one being. And so they just think that, that uh, Jesus was a form of God, that it was just, but he wasn't a separate person. But here John is saying, whoever denies that Jesus is a Christ, he is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So you can't be for God, but deny part of who God is. So continuing in verse 24, let that abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is a promise that he has promised us, eternal life. But these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, we are now children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we see him as he is. And everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sin has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So this is kind of repeats what Paul is, says in Galatians 5, uh, 22 through 23, where it talks about the fruits of the, of the Spirit are these, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That if someone says they are a Christian, that those are the types of things that we should see in our life, right? And so if we see things that aren't in their life, then that should raise some questions. I think that that's also, you know, it talks about, I think it was, is it Timothy, the letters to Timothy where Paul says don't, you know, when you appoint leaders to the church, they shouldn't be new believers because, you know, they might be puffed up with pride. You know, you kind of have to prove out that salvation. We have to learn how to walk in the light, how to abide in him. That, um, you know, we talked about how we've already 
been made perfect. Our spirit has been made perfect, but God is making us holy. That's a process of sanctification so that when we make Jesus the Lord of our life, we have the, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And it's then he can start working in our life and help and, you know, work out that, you know, we're working out that salvation. We're walking it out. Um, and these things that don't line up with God's word, those are, should be signs to us that there's something in our life that isn't pleasing to God. Um, we can't continue. You know, John is like being really, and sometimes people think that John is saying that it's a matter of works. It's not, it's not a matter of works, but we have to, he's talking about, we have to abide in Christ and it, it is a matter of free will. We have to choose to do that. And when we choose to come to Christ, we also choose to continue to submit ourselves to God. Um, I think we're going to be hitting that a little bit. So I'm going to keep on reading here. For this is a message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was wicked, the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his, and his brother's righteous. It was a matter of jealousy, right? Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life. Whoever, um, because we love the brethren... He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So this is, uh, again, this is, he just said this in chapter 2. He's repeating it again in chapter 3. And this is also repeating what Jesus said when he said, whoever calls his brother, you know, says his brother is an idiot or rocket, he is, he is guilty of murder because you've already murdered him in your heart. And you know, when Jesus was talking to, and preaching, and he said, well, he said, you know, which is the greatest commandment? And he said, well, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And they said, well, who's my neighbor? They were trying to qualify it. Like, who do we have to be kind and nice to? And that is when he gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the Samaritan is, you know, that was an answer. It's anyone. It's everyone. And it's even the people that you don't think are, that you don't like. You know, those are the people that you are supposed to be kind to. Okay. Um, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay, lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoever has this this world's goods and see his brothers in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure, assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him, and by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. And beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone into the, out into the world, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now and is now already in the world. So looking at this, um, this is, I think this can be true in several areas. I think this can be true. Like if you have, like people have these experiences or encounters with a spirit you know, the question is, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Is, is he of God? Um, I think that's one thing. But I've also noticed this just in, like, interviews with people. Uh, you see interviews about people, uh, inter journalists asking, like, politicians especially, who they think, you know, who Jesus is to them. Maybe they don't know what the right response is, but I think also part of it is that is a testing of the spirits and there it's a, com a conviction of the Holy Spirit to tell the truth in that situation. So we don't have an excuse for, for being deceived, right? You ask somebody, who is Jesus to you? And they can't give you an answer or it's kind of a weird answer. 
and they don't say he is God come as man. He died for my sins and I have salvation in him. Pay attention to that. Don't dismiss it because they, that is, that is God showing you where that person is at. And if you ignore it, then you don't have really any excuse for being deceived later on because God gave you that warning flag to begin with. So, so continuing in, this is after chapter four, verse four. You are of God, God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, he who knows God hears us, he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for the love, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that God has sent the son as savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We, made him, we love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother. He is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that that he who loves God must love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him who, be, who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we could keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is a victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. So this is, it here is, um, these three bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. He is, this really kind of echoes the Shema, which is, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You know, so it, this is this is John kind of ec is echoing that, and this is John saying that this, you know, he's talking about the three persons of the Trinity here, and then it also in this next sentence it's talking about how we come to be one with God. So we. Uh, it says, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. So it's not saying we are, but we, uh, we agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is a witness of God, which he has testified of his son. He who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is a testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And that's what I was saying earlier, is that 
you know, it's about believing, you know, so salvation. Actually, I have recorded a flip through my, my Bible that I'm retiring. And the last section I have in that of my notes from my reading is salvation is believing. So if we stop believing, then, you know, we've basically, we're basically denying the Jesus, right, as our salvation. So, in verse 14, now this is a confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sins not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. So, just to stop here for a second, there's a couple of things here that it says, um, if we ask anything according to his will, right? So, sometimes um, people, I don't know, there's just so many different beliefs in Christianity, in, in the church. Like, some people don't think that you can really ask God of anything, and if, you know, somebody prays and expects, like, healing or deliverance or something, they think they're heretics, but that's basically, you know, Jesus said, you know, you will do these things, those, all those who come in my name, you know, they, they'll cast out demons, they heal the sick, and, you know, that, that those things would continue because they're coming in his name, and what he did, his disciples would also do. You know, Jesus came and he lived life as man. It was God came, come as man, but he lived a life as man, perfectly submitted to the will of God, and you know, it, through, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that's within us, that He did those miracles. You know, we're, we are supposed to walk according to what He did. Some people, and, and that's the Orthodox Christian belief, some people find that, some Christians don't, um, don't like that. It's like this, they have this idea of, um, that God, that Jesus came as sort of this God-man, something that was a mix of, of, uh, human and God, and that's 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 a heresy. Jesus lived as man, but the other part here is that you know it's important to remember that Jesus, um, it's according to God's will, and Jesus said, "I only do what I see the Father doing." So it wasn't like him going around just like doing whatever he wanted to do. He just like, "What is the will of the Father?" And there was this. Um, I only saw the last part of it. There was this little um, this little girl that, that died, and um, it was a, the daughter of one of the worship leaders at Bethel. And they, so they were praying for her resurrection. Now, I guess they just do that a lot. They just pray for you know people to be raised from the dead. They've actually seen some of them. I know people who, I, there's a lady that I used to be in a prayer ministry with, and she said that when she was in... Um, she just become a believer. She was a nurse, and uh, this man died. She's like, no, you know, she prayed, and the man, you know, came back to life. I there's a Christian scholar named Craig Keener who has he has this two volume book on ministries. He's married to um, a lady who, in her village, they have I can't remember the number, but like this a whole like almost a tribe of people who've been raised from the dead, you know. And so I saw a lot of um, really. Um, mocking comments towards, you know, people praying um, for her resurrection. And to kind of back up a little bit, I was researching a little bit more. So last year, there was another, I don't know if they were worship leaders, but there was another couple that was like a leader in the church, and they had this, uh, their son and their daughter had this really weird sort of illness, and the doctors were like, you know, you're just going to have to go home and prepare. They're, they're not going to make it. And, um, so they, the, the, the father said, you know, there was this giant of unbelief that was facing me. And I went home and he wrote a song. It's like sing a hallelujah. I think that was the one it was. And those, both of their children recovered, but it was, it was a period of, of time. And I saw, um, as I was researching this, I saw another, because this had been like over a year, this had been going on, and I saw another one of, um, uh, I don't even know how to how to describe them and be polite about it, but there was a, a Christian ministry that um, they don't believe in, 
I don't know. They probably say they believe in miracles. Basically, they're Calvinists. They call everybody who believes in, you know, gifts of the spirit, heretics. And they had this article that was written, and the, the the most charitable thing I can say about it, it was very callous. I mean, I just kind of mocking this family that has two children that are battling this life-threatening condition. It's basically saying, oh yeah, well, you know, they can't heal their own kids. Like blah, blah, blah. And it's like, uh, you know, reading this this gospel, you know, this letter of John, I mean, how would you classify that? Would you classify those of, of, as words of life or words of death? Yeah. So anyway, but those, those children recovered. And that that couple is friends with the couple that just lost their daughter. And so the the mother of those children that recovered had posted a, a, a like a word of encouragement for them, you know, when they were, you know, praying for their daughter. And I just, I, what would that be like to have, you know, you've been given not one, but two miracles in the healing of your children. And so how can you, you know, it's just like one of those things, like when, when you've experienced a miracle and then you're, you're, you know, people that you want them to receive that same sort of that grace and blessing and that miracle. But I think it's important to remember that it has to be, you know, Jesus, there were a lot of people that died, right? We know of a handful of people that he prayed and they, you know, they were raised from the dead, but it wasn't everybody that died. He said, I only see it. I only do what I see the father doing. And so we have to be tied in and we have to be um, learning how to discern God's will. Like, can we ask for this? And I don't, I don't have, sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to know what the reason is. So why do some people get their child back and others don't? Like, I don't, I don't know that reason. Sometimes I don't think we'll know that reason until you know, we see Jesus face to face and then we'll, we'll, we can see, okay, what that purpose was. But I'll, I'll just say this about the, that whole um, situation with that little girl and Bethel praying for them. I think that, um, you know, I would rather err on not knowing God's will and just praying and asking rather than having those, you know, having a potential miracle sitting there that you miss because you're afraid to ask. You know, because the Bible says that you, you have not because you ask not. You, you, you don't have because you're you're asking with with wrong um, motivations or wrong will. I mean, I I, I have um, a friend of mine who her daughter, she has twins. She has four girls, but she had one of her, her twin daughters. She started having this um, twitch inside of her face. And it was like pretty massive. I think she was three at the time. And it was just like the whole side of her face. And so she had sent out a prayer request. It was just by text. She said, hey, you know, we're going into the doctor um, to see what this is, is. And I'm just hoping it's not genetic. And this is something that they can handle or it's, that can be dealt with and fixed. So they went They went in, um, saw the doctor. The diagnosis was, uh, I think it was Magnus Gun disease. But it was basically a neurological disorder. It was genetic. And the doctors told her there's nothing we can do about it. Um, she's just going to have to learn how to manage it when she gets older. So she sent that out and like just giving us an update. And I saw her at church that Sunday and I was like, you know what? I just, you know, I know that you're fine and with it, but I just want to keep praying for her healing because, you know, I want to have that faith. You know, Jesus said, if we had the faith even of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain to be moved and it would be moved. You know, I want to, I want to have that faith. I want to, you know, practice praying so that, you know, I can pray and know God will, will answer. And so we continue, you know, I'm like, we're, we just prayed for it then. And I know she had other, I know she had other people that were praying for her. And so then, so that was on Sunday. And then the next Thursday, so this is just how cool God is. So I was, this is at the time I was in the apologetics program and I was in a class on scripture and apologetics implications with, uh, with Dr. Michael Kona. And that Thursday we were starting a unit on miracles. And one of his questions was, have you ever experienced a miracle? So just in that morning I was thinking, um, oh, well, you know, I've, I've had experienced other miracles. I'm like, okay, what, what am I going to, what am I going to share? So just as I was trying to figure that out, I get a text from my friend and there are two videos and one of them is 
a, um, a video of her daughter from the week before. She had taken it right before she went into the doctor to get a diagnosis. It was a picture, and you could see it was a couple minutes long, and you could see the, the twitch on her face. It was you know, pretty massive and pretty frequent. It wasn't just like every once in a while. And then she said, then she said another one from that morning, and there was nothing. There was no nothing. This is something the doctor said we can do nothing about. And God healed that neurological dis disorder. She said that they hadn't seen, hadn't she hadn't seen it since Monday. And even her her um, daughter's teacher remarked on that. This has been a few years ago. My one, my youngest daughter actually does the um, children's ministry, and she had this little girl in my in her class. I said so. I was telling my daughter this story, and she said. Yeah, no, there's nothing. I mean, even years later, that it never returned, it never came back. And so, you know, we prayed and God answered. And this is when the doctors had said there was nothing we could do. So I just have to share this because it's just like, seriously, sometimes Christians act like skeptics. And I just think about how many miracles are like sitting there, basically laying by the side of the road because we're afraid to ask or we just don't believe. So then um, I had... I got that this morning. I was like, God is just so good. Like I have this assignment and God sends me a, a new miracle. So I have something to answer for this assignment. So I post it on, um, in the discussion board and I share this. Okay. My, my miracle that I shared was like, it was like the tamest out of all of them, out of all the pe situations people had experienced. It was probably like the most low key out of all of them. A neurological disorder just healed. There are people who, I mean, I'd have to go back and look because I don't, wouldn't want to mis, you know, misrepresent the stories that were told, but there was this whole long list of people in the apologetics program and they were sharing some of those really miraculous events that, you know, God had given them. And so then there was, I'm not going to say who it was, but there was one person in the, um, in, in the class, and I, I'd have to go back and see if I kept the discussions in, in the from the class, but I don't think he posted anything. He doesn't believe in miracles. Or I guess this is what Calvinists will say, or cessationists will say. They'll say, we believe God could, we just don't believe he does, right? That's what they say. Or they just think it's a divine act of God, that there's just, it just kind of like the spontaneous, you know, miracle. And I think sometimes that can happen, but... You know, if you look through the Old Testament, and so if we read through Hebrews just a little while ago, it said that in the in the faith chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, and keep in mind, this is before the cross, Elijah was just a man, man with faith, and he prayed, and it did not rain for three and a half years because of somebody prayed. He's just a man just like us, right? So anyway, this, this other guy in my class says... Um, He's like, well, this is like another position on miracles. And then he posts something from John MacArthur, who is like this massive sensation, cessationist. I'll just be honest. I don't really listen to John MacArthur a lot because, you know, he's always trashing on charismatics and he's a cessationist. So I don't really listen to him. I will say I do have a more favorable opinion of him after I watched his interview with Ben Shapiro. And he sat and he basically laid out the plan of salvation um, on Ben Shapiro's show for like 45 minutes. So... You know what? I don't agree with him on spiritual gifts. I don't agree with him on miracles, but I do think that he knows how to present the gospel. And I'm just so, so, so thankful that he he just went out and shared it with with Ben Shapiro. Because quite frankly, when Bishop Barron was on that same show, he didn't. He kind of punted on that one. But anyway, so I was like, I was think I kind of got into it with the guy that was posting that because I'm thinking, okay, here you have. All of these people in this class, and are you saying, basically what you're saying is that we're delusional, that we don't know what happened, because you're denying what, I mean, especially like with the miracle that my friend's daughter experienced, I had video evidence of it, video evidence, and you're basically saying that, no, 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 that's not true, I mean, you're delusional, that's basically like, who's the guy? Um, Hume, Hume, like we're supposed to deny the evidence of our, of our eyes because miracles just don't happen. And that's basically what they're saying. So anyway, the reason I wanted to do this is that, like read this, is that there's just so much in the book of John, for, for Sean. I mean, it covers so, so much. And I think that, um, like I was in my Sunday school class last week, we were working on Luke chapter two and 
they were kind of, you know, using the sheet of paper that they were supposed to be memorizing off of as, you know, folding it up and making airplanes. And, and I said, well, what would happen, you know, if we didn't have any books? Like, this is a thing. Like, if we had, like, some sort of EMP attack and it wiped out our electrical grid and, you know, a lot of us have stuff on Kindle and all those books were gone and all those records were gone. If all we had was what was in our head, would we be able to tell the story of Jesus? And so I think Luke 2, you know, that's that's a pretty important passage that we should all be able to just tell the story. I also think that this letter of 1 John, and that's why I wanted to read the whole thing. And I know that it was a lot longer than I normally do. But I, this is just, there is so much in it. You know, I it's I think it, it John, in it, John explains the tension between you know, it's not just, it's not cheap grace, but it's also not works that we have to, we have to be abiding in him. It's, you know, it's about our will. It's like how important it is to have our lives line up with what we say we believe, right? So it, this is just, this is one of those that it's almost one that you have to like read over and over and over again. So you just get it in and, you know, that we can, you know, we want to have a lifestyle of that we're abiding in him. And I think, to me anyway, the message of this letter is that the key to that is that we have to love one another. We need to be praying for people, even even people, and I know this is hard, like I said, but people that don't agree with us, that are in opposition to us, we need to be praying for them. We need to be praying that you know, God, um, forgives them for wrong actions, for wrong words. We need to be, you know, asking God to show grace to them. And we also need to be praying that God lifts the scales from our own eyes so that we can see in ourselves, um, where that, you know, where the areas in our life that don't, that aren't pleasing to the Holy Spirit. So anyway, that's the longer one, but again, we only have like, we only have next week, I think, and then, yeah, and then we're going to be done with this one year chronological Bible. So, anyway, the other thing is, I did want to share, last week, I, I um, asked for prayer on getting that Luke 2 out um, video, and I, I did it. I actually got it posted on Sunday. I actually asked a couple of my friends, like, I was asking them, and they're like, you know what, we just... It's just going to take time. It just takes a long time to render stuff like that. And for me, my takeaway what from it was, I was able to ask somebody, is this just me? Am I doing something wrong? Or is does this really just take this long? And the answer was, it really just takes that long. And so I think for, for us as Christians, sometimes we're going through stuff and we think, okay, is this just me? Am I doing something wrong? And so sometimes we just need to be around other Christians that say, you know what? This is the way life is sometimes. Just keep going. Just keep going. You know, things will get better and, you know, you'll get through it. And I think we need to have that, um, we need to have that sort of feedback and, you know, encouragement from other people. So the other thing, and this just came up because I was talking to my mom on Christmas and she goes, oh, so how's your friend Zach? So I had shared a little bit about my friend, um, Zach a few months ago. He is the, per he's was in the apologetics program with me. He was actually the second cohort to graduate from the apologetics program from Houston Baptist University. He's in the, the, um, the PhD program at Faulkner University is working on his PhD in humanities and he has a spinal muscular dystrophy and I think that's what it is. So anyway, I didn't know this until I started reading a little bit about it, but he is a, I guess it's a progressive d disease and so you, you gradually continue to lose more muscle strength. And he had, I mentioned a few, a few months ago that he had, he had gotten approved for this new treatment called Spinraza and uh, it's actually pretty cool and but they have this whole video that shows how it reverses like what what the problem is in that condition and how this um this treatment reverses that and so for him you know his hope was that you know it would help him maintain what he has so one, a couple months ago when I shared about that like my prayer is that like anything like that you know they have this whole list of negative side effects and so my prayer is like that when he gets this that you know there's no complications and that there's no negative side effects and that you know it works effectively and you know and that it works as it you know as it should and effectively and he gets only the benefits from it and then the ne negative side effects so when I was talking to my mom I said oh yeah you know he he just got a, he's has his appointment it's he's supposed to be going in in January my mom said well he's a good candidate for divine healing too and I'm like yeah he is so 
I'm just praying that, you know, God, I'll just be honest with you. Zach is just like so amazing to me. He's only like, I think he just turned 27, you know, so he's, he's younger and he's, um, he has a job. He's either like a, a insurance analyst or an underwriter or something like that. He's for the an unexpected journal. He's the managing editor. He just does so much. You just have no idea. And I think I was thinking, man, I don't know if the world could handle Zach Unleashed. I mean, he just is so um, amazing as 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 he is with with all these disabilities that he works in, through in spite of. So anyway, but I'm I'm praying with my mom. We're just we're just gonna be praying for um, Zach's healing. And anyway, but. I just think that, you know, God is good. And I think that sometimes we miss the blessings that we have because of our doubt and unbelief. You know, we have these, we're trapped in our, you know, these walls of our own making. I just think we need to be, that's what I'm doing. I, I want to just practice praying for, you know, for, for miracles, for God's miracles. Like I want to have, yes, we need to be, you know, we need to learn how to, to see what God's will is and to be willing to speak that. Um, you know, David in one of his psalms says, I believe God and so I spoke. And, you know, God, there's a, I'm not sure where this is, but there's a, a passage that says God does nothing um, unless he reveals it to his prophets. And so I think this is one of those things that is kind of like, um, it causes controversy sometimes. You know, there's, there's people that believe that God is just sovereign and he is but he chooses to work through his people you know originally we were given dominion over the earth right man was given dominion and we we ceded that to satan so he is the god of the world but when jesus comes <coughs> came and conquered death in the grave and he conquered sin that when we submit ourselves to him we regain that you know he is he's reclaiming what was what was lost is this progressive restoration. And so I think that, um, I don't know. I just, I just in general, I think especially for us as Protestants, we've really kind of locked ourselves up into this little box of unbelief. And I mentioned that guy, Craig Keener, and, um, he was, you know, they're used to seeing miracles. I don't know about you, but I know people who like, they will go over into other countries and, they see miracles all the time. They see people, you know, blind that see, deaf that hear, people raised from the dead. And uh, Craig Keener said, he didn't say what it was, but I was watching a video that he, he had, uh, and he was saying that he had this really bad headache. And one of his friends that, you know, used to going and praying for healing in other areas said that when they came and um, he prayed for them and it, it, the, the headache didn't work, or the, or the headache stayed. I mean, the prayer didn't work. And he said, well, it doesn't work here because, and I'm like, what does that, I don't, I don't get that. Like, what does that mean? I mean, there must be something, right? There must be some sort of obstacle and block from us seeing the same miracles that they see in other places. So what is it? Is it our unbelief? You know, Jesus said that in his, you know, in the New Testament said that Jesus could only perform minor miracles in his hometown because of their unbelief. So is it because we have this tradition of cessationism, of rejecting the power of the Holy Spirit, that that's a block to seeing it? I mean, this is this is what I honestly believe. Like, I think that, you know, if somebody is coming and they're asking for prayer and they've ever been in agreement with cessationism or any tradition that denies the power of the Holy Spirit, that needs to be repented of and confessed. And then, you know, it's like, I believe in the fullness of God, you know, like I, that you're a good God and that you are the God who is has authority over all the works of Satan. And let me tell you, this physical corruption is a, is a work of Satan. It's not of God. It's a work of Satan. So anyway, um, I, I don't even know how long I've gone. I've already gone for an hour because I ran off of the first one, but, but we're almost at the end of 2019 going into 2020. And that's going to be my prayer that, um, that for myself, for this, for this next year, that I can see what God's will is, and that I can be praying in agreement with it. And um, I just, you know, we have an awesome God. And, and I think that sometimes we kind of forget that sometimes. We know it, but we don't expect to see it. And so I am um, praying that God help me have that expectation to see the goodness of God. Um, That's another verse from one of... Um, 
David Psalms is I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So that is my that is going to be my theme for 2020. I am expecting to see the goodness of God in the here and now. I'm not waiting for until I get to heaven and you know where it's fully evident, but that I see it here. That His you know His will is on earth in my place in in my family just as it is in heaven that i have the fullness and the goodness of god so anyway um i am i'm praying for the favor and goodness of god of you and like if you have any prayer requests send them to me you know what i want to be practicing my faith i want to be praying for people and i want to be seeing i want to be seeing the answers i mean i think that's i've mentioned that before i mean that's the cool thing about praying for people that you know because you see you see the the answer and the truth of it like my friend and her daughter she, I s still see the evidence of that miracle and it, it's, it was a true miracle. And so they are a walking, living miracle. I mean, there's even just, I, I might have to see if I can get her to tell her story because there was so much more the, surrounding that whole, um, you know, her life and the, the, you know, her twins and, you know, their family. There's just so much that, that God has been working in their life. And it's just, they are just like this little you know, it's like when God creates a family, we're like these little, um, these little ships, you know, going along in God's fleet. And, and that's just as what, what I see them as. They're just such a, such a wonderful family. And I just know that God has so many good things planned for them that, that he has such a plan and a purpose for their life. So anyway, thanks for watching. Um, my, one of my longest ones yet, I think, but, um, I, let's just have, let's just have a great next year. And thanks for praying for Zach. I'm, I don't know that he watches these, but I'm just going to tell him that I have people praying for him. And so we are, yeah, yeah, it's hard. So Debbie Elaine says, I keep walking in things I still don't understand, but I'm looking for the truth to propel me forward. Yeah, sometimes we just don't. And that's the way a lot of it's been. Like, I don't even know what's going on here, but hey, I, I'm believing that God is good and that he has good plans for me. And I believe he has good plans for you. And so we're just we hold on to that and we keep moving forward. It's um, Hebrews 12, 2. Like, so we run with the, the endurance of the race that God has set before us and we're keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and, and finisher of our faith. So keep our eyes on Jesus. So anyway, I will um, hope you guys have a great next week. And um, again, I will see you next time. Talk to you soon.